ahead and get started. In the time of Q&A, there's plenty, there's folks with plenty of seats right over here. And some right back there. So thanks everyone for coming today. Um, and I know that uh, yesterday there was quite, quite a bit of buzz about uh, our good time of Q&A with uh, Dave on Tuesday. So um, anyway, yeah, we're looking forward to this time today. Okay, when we um, ended up on Tuesday, one of the, we, we said we were going to talk about a couple of things today, so maybe it would just be best to start there. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions from everybody. Um, I know that it's been your practice for, what, 30 years to preach through books to the consecutive expedition. And that's not something that people typically associate with mega church. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about why that's important to you? And, and I mean, what, what, when did you start with it, I guess? <clears throat> well, um, you know, I think we end up doing a lot of stuff. It got modeled for you, and, and um, my dad was a pastor, and um, he was a expository preacher. And it's just what he did, and I grew up with that. Um, and I, I remember just having it in my head that, well, that's, I saw so much leadership coming from how he preached in the whole church that I was just, uh, that was just kind of thought, uh, I just, I knew that everybody didn't do it that way, but I really admired how it did, and I saw the effect it had on people's lives over the years. He had two churches in his life. I don't know, you know, maybe that's something to do with why I'm in one place and just kind of have it in me that he stayed. So I valued it. I mean, so I valued it. So I just kind of stuck with that. Um, I remember when I came to, when I went to Open Door though again almost 30 years ago at the uh, at the uh, uh, candidate um, process. I met the elders, and again I'm 27 years old, so whatever. I'm, I'm pretty scared, but at the same time I, I I didn't want the job that bad, so I was kind of just well, doing what I do here. I was being myself, which is quite offensive sometimes. Um, <laughs> people don't, don't like that. Um, but anyway, did this guy this guy who ended up becoming a real good friend of mine says. He said a couple things. He says, are, are you a respecter of time in your preaching? And I said, I said, well, uh, what do you mean? He says, well, the pastor we had before you, he spoke for 20 minutes. And I said, oh, man, 20 minutes. And I, I said, Howard Hendricks had been at my dad's church just a week before. And I said, I just came from a thing where I heard Howard Hendricks speak for 45 minutes. And the truth is, if you have nothing to say, 10 minutes is way too long. But I think he could have gone on to another hour. So I, I talked about that. But I also said I do expository preaching, and they've never heard of that before. And the whole, the whole idea of going through a book verse by verse by verse. And I, one of the, you know, I don't think you have to do it. Obviously, you don't have to do it that way. I don't know if anybody does it anymore. But um, it was really good for me. I mean, do the math again. I was 27 years old. I was still in seminary, just getting right out of seminary. Um, it was a really good discipline for me to uh, be in a book. And um, I, I liked, it, it created a number of things. I felt like it really created, with the tools I got, with the exegesis and Greek and Hebrew and all that kind of stuff, um, it, it forced me to stay in the text. And I felt like it became, it was good for the people, but I felt, also felt like it became over time a real education for me. The, the sermon I gave today, okay, um, um, I preached through Philippians too, so I came to Colossians and I heard Paul say this. I have I have Philippians in my spirit. I have it in my mind because I spent a year and a half in Philippians, and so it's like there's that there's that benefit. I think another benefit of the expository for me. So there was a self education thing, the discipline of not getting. Quite frankly, I didn't get to pick what I talked about. I talked about stuff I didn't want to talk about because it was the next four verses. Uh, so I'm talking about it, and they noticed when I skipped. So, um, why didn't you do those verses? Because I don't like those verses. <laughs> that was, actually, I would say that, and then I would preach it. Um, it. It really, it really was, and I, I guess at that level, for a young person, I would, I would recommend it. I certainly, I mean, there are people who, who do much better in another thing, but I, I don't know how I would even be thinking if I just talked about whatever I wanted to talk about. Because uh, he ended up, actually, I mean, I ended up talking about everything. I remember when I first went there, I, uh, the first book I did was Ephesians. Um, I don't exactly remember why, but I remember doing First Corinthians. First Corinthians, I mean, you talk about sex, you talk about, you talk about money, you talk about, you talk about everything. And um, so it just became the thing we did. Now, 
I can also tell you part of my story is that there was a time a few years ago when I felt like I had become a slave to that, and I quit. And, uh, and what I mean by that is I, 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 I remember talking to a friend of mine and saying, this is just burning me out. I feel like a coal miner, and for 25 years I've been <laughs> mining the coal, and I am just tired of the tyranny of next four verses, next five verses, whatever. And he said to me, he said, hey, and this is like weird to me, because this is, I have this huge reverence for expository preaching. He said, Dave, hey, the, the word's in you. Just, just, I don't know if that means anything to you, but it was like, it was almost like back off, back off a little bit. And the first series I did at Open Door, this is several years ago now, that wasn't strictly expository, it was a series in the life of David, I called it A Journey of the Heart. And it was a journey, and I was even using that kind of language and it was the first series I ever did where I didn't feel like I had to do every story in first and second Samuel. I did, I did the ones I was drawn to, which is like, what? How pathetic. And, <laughs> you know, and, but that's what I did. I paid attention. I, 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 the, the language I even started using, I was going through first Samuel, and I would just pay attention to what I would smell. I talk about that now. I, uh, we have a message team that I meet with every Wednesday. And a lot of where we, like we're going through Colossians now, but that's, we came back to that. Um, well, I talked about from week to week in a text, what do you, what do you smell? What, what, what do we, what's the aroma here? Um, how long should we stay on this topic? We're in something in Colossians right now. That's what I'm in right now. I brought Colossians because I'm in Colossians. Um, but then I did a journey on the Holy Spirit. Um, but when I, let, let me just stick with the one on um, the journey of the heart was the life of David. And we had some people, like, church people are so weird. I love you. It's in and um, uh, uh, I mean, I had people who just thought I was off the rails because I wasn't. How come you're not preaching the word anymore? And I, I remember telling them, I go, what? you know what? At the end of week, about a year and a half, uh, the journey of the heart with the life of David, and at the end of that journey, I didn't do every story in First and Second Samuel. Went into the Kings, I think a little bit. Well, we did a pretty good job with the book of First and Second Samuel. And, um, and I think I taught that pretty well. Then we did the journey uh, with the Holy Spirit, and I did some stuff in First Corinthians, obviously, in First Corinthians 12, 14, 12 and 14, and um, everything was expositional, but I wasn't, you know, I didn't feel obligated to do all of First Corinthians. I just did the journey with the Spirit, blah, 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 and um, then, then I did, then I did a thing, I was actually inspired by a thing Rob Bell did uh, called the Rock Way Rabbi. This rabbi thing, and I was fascinated by Jesus and the historical perspective of him as a rabbi. And I kind of got my teeth into that. And then using that paradigm, I taught a sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, a sermon on the Mount, and we did about a year and a half of that. You're not doing an expository. Oh my goodness. We just did Matthew 7, verse 5, and the week before that, we did verse 4. Anyway, so. <laughs> So, I don't know if that tells you kind of yeah. what it's been the journey. And then we went back to Colossians as the first book study we've done in several years, and now people are coming back to the church because we are Christian. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I know you guys, and I know that prompted a bunch of questions, so I'm just going to open it up to, to all of you. So, uh, let's go ahead and take some questions from, from, from this crowd. Uh, preaching or anything you've heard today or questions you've got about uh, about church the open door. The message team? Yeah. yeah. The team you referred to? The message team? Yeah, I got to uh, talk a little bit more about <laughs> 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 yeah, please, You want me to answer? Yeah. Please, please wait for the microphone. Yeah. So we can, uh, record it up posterity. This is a, uh, he asked about the team and the message team I did reference to. This is a fairly new thing. I mean, it's several years, but in the course of things, um, it's, a, it's a new thing. But I've, I've just kind of developed some time ago a team of people that I meet with on Wednesdays. I hand pick them, um, and they're people for a number of reasons. One, there are some, some people in the church who really have some teaching gifts and preaching gifts, and um, I want them in that room just to kind of be around and be in the dialogue of even knowing what I go through when, when I'm writing a, a, a text or, or writing a sermon and some of the angst of it, so they're kind of in behind the scenes. So I have some people on that team that I would want to invest in. 
Um, some of them are people I just trust, like somebody on staff. Generally, they're staff people just because of the time. I can't pull people from the church. But um, um, people who I trust theologically, like they think theologically, so if I'm saying something really off, they'll spot that, or they'll have some insights into the text that I will miss. I also had a guy, I remember, and he's still on the message team, um, he, at the time, all he, all, not all he was, but he was like our sound guy, and he's developed into a whole different thing. But I loved Terry. Terry was a guy, I don't know if you know about people like this, but he was the kind of guy, if this makes sense to Terry, this makes sense. Because he was like, this has to work in my marriage, this has to work in real life, don't just give me these flowery things. And Terry was a guy I wanted there because he always would wrinkle his nose and go, oh, I don't get it. And if he didn't get it, then I had to work, I had a lot of work. So yeah, it's just a team that I did. Uh, um, I don't know if you care about the logistics, but for me, um, my rhythm is kind of, Tuesday's a study day for me. Um, and I'll, I mean, I'll do other things that day, like I'll have meetings or somebody I might have to meet or something like that, but I will have a chunk of time on Tuesday to get into text. Um, I have some liberty there, to, uh, you know, I'll get in a fall of the commentary, do the Greek, whatever I'm going to do with that kind of stuff. It doesn't, I don't have to feel like it's preachable yet, it, you know, it's very chaotic all over my notes. But I want something percolating, I want something to be thinking about. And sometimes Tuesday afternoon I'll meet with somebody or something like that. But Tuesday's a study day, and then Wednesday is meetings all day. Um, I don't care if you probably don't care about my schedule, but I mean, there's kind of a rhythm to uh, the priority I have for the preaching. Monday's my day off, Tuesday I study, some appointments in the afternoon, all day Wednesday, and, and one of those meetings would be message team. And so at message team, what I'll do is bring whatever I did on, on Tuesday. And sometimes, quite frankly, it's a mess. Sometimes I, I'm almost nervous about the meeting because I have to say, you know what, I studied all day yesterday and it just feels yucky so far and I'm not, I haven't found, and this is, this is, I, mean, I think this is, it's interesting to help some of these younger guys come along because I, the way I talk, I talk about, yes, I know the Greek and yes, I know how this, this sentence diagrams, but I haven't found, I haven't, I can't find that thread that goes through this whole thing because you gotta find that, find this thread, this thought that goes through, and I just can't find that thing. And, and so even in some of just the, the ways I talk about my struggle with presenting it, teaches how to, how to think about this. And so, yeah, we, it's about a, an hour long meeting and, and we joke, I mean, sometimes the message team really helps me because I'll bring something and they'll, you know, pow, 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 and oh yeah, I didn't, I, I wouldn't have even thought of that. And it's just a very creative process. And other times I'll just tell them, and I will tell them the truth. I mean, you know, all this just did, this gave me more work. I can't possibly say everything that got put on the table today. And um, so you just you didn't help me at all. Thanks a lot. And, um, and we all have. But, um, but it, even if it isn't like wonderful, it's always good. It's just good. It's kind of a discipline of that. And so, anyway. And I don't care about this, but Thursday would be another study day. And Friday, we have a Saturday night service and then, uh, and then Sunday services. And so, I try to get my final draft done. My goal is my final draft is done by noon on Friday, and I meet with a group of guys at two o'clock on Friday, and we sit because we had that cigar, smoke cigar. Yeah, really good. It's my favorite part. <laughs> it is. It is. Dave, uh, could I follow up on what you yeah done before? Thanks for your ministry today and choosing that. And uh, I noticed that in both cases started with the text that you were opening that was read, and then you went either for explication or application to other places in the text. Mm -hmm. Is that what you normally do on a uh, week by week basis when you're spending a year and a half in Philippians? Or yeah. It is okay. Normally. Yeah. Um, I, in fact, it's something I noticed because we, um, after all these years, we have a second voice now at Open Door, guy Steve Weens. Um, I'm the senior pastor, he's a teaching pastor. I'll go four or five weeks, he'll go two, maybe three. And what I've noticed is he almost always starts with a story. He starts, but I, and I go, yeah, this is weird, and I don't always think about it. But I must always start, open your Bible to Colossians 1, verse 7, unpack it some way, and then we're off. And he will, you know, the other day I was doing that, da, 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 and it'll, it'll be incredible because he'll come back to the text, and he does the same thing in an entirely different way. But, Today you said something like, I'm going to go to Philippians to develop this, and that's weird. Do you really believe that's weird, or do you no. think, okay. 
I'm just trying to help people who thought it was weird that yeah. I knew what they're thinking. <laughs> Good man. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't think that's weird at all. In fact, that would, that's another one of those uh, benefits of that expository thing. Um, I've had. I remember when I went through the Book of Acts. There were places in the Book of Acts. Okay, I'll just give you an example. This one's coming to my mind. I would look at Paul and I'd go, "The guy is like the Energizer Bunny. He never quits." He just he goes from here to here, he gets beat up, he's back. I don't, you know, persecuted but not tracked down the this guy. I can't relate to him. He's a maniac. And and um, it was either that maybe it was it was what I it was one or the other. I was even going first Corinthians and I remembered Acts, but I would I would remember the story in Acts and I go, no, this he sounds really positive here. But over in Acts when he was actually at Corinth, he was really going through a hard time. And he talked and I would have I would have these dialogues with Paul in the pulpit. Was it really that easy for you? And he would, and then I would quote something right out of Acts. It says, "When we were in Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. We had to come for without fears of it. God who comes through the press, come for us with coming of Titus. No, it wasn't easy. Dave. Why do you think it was easy? Like that? I mean, he would be yelling at me for thinking it was easy. You know, that's, so no, the, I don't think it's where to go to Philippians to explain Colossians. <laughs> Yeah. I'll ask a question. Uh, a lot of pastors of big churches struggle a little bit with how to promote maturity in Christ, educational ministry outside the pulpit. What has the what's it like at Church of the Open Door with regard to educational ministry with adults, small groups? Uh, have you wrestled with that? Yeah. Yeah, um, we wrestled with that. Um, yeah, we have small groups. Um, what I think I, I, I touched on this a little bit on Tuesday. One of the things I really try to do is I, I want people to, okay, this is the small group and then the education thing. But I really want people, I think that people who are reasonably healthy very often already have significant community. And I don't want to be pulling them out of their already established and let's say healthy community to, co to, to, to come to stuff at church. I don't want to just keep perpetuating like you we I want to use you to make sure our program is good and you're kind of cool, so come. I, I really want to create environments and environment, I think we have created it, where the community that you have counts. And I, I do, one of our philosophies, I don't know if this is going to help at all, but I think paradigms and, 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 and ways of seeing things really do help people and they, they can be catalytic. When I do vision talks, for instance, I call them locker room talks. And one of the big things we talk about at Open Door is that this building, this ministry thing here is a locker room. You don't play the game. This is this is where you come to hear the plays. This is this is where you come after playing. You play the game out there. And what we want to do is uh, equip you to to, to 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 be able to play the game out there. And um, but yeah, we have classes on spiritual formation. We teach people the disciplines. Um, there, there's just kind of a running um, series of. Uh, Christian education for adults and kids all the way. I mean, it would be, I don't know, pretty much like a church. <laughs> I don't know if I'm answering your question very well. But well, I raise it only because there are, some, there are some mega church pastors recently who have been very open about, we've got a wonderful pulpit ministry at our church, but we really have been struggling outside of the pulpit to get people growing, get people maturing, and sort of thinking out loud about strategies, particularly for large church settings. Yes. With, with regards to those sorts of issues. Yeah, and we have, and, and see what I can tell you are the classes we have and all those kinds of things, but I wish whoever said that they struggle with that, I think everybody struggles with that. And, and how people, how are people formed? We've been talking about spiritual formation. Um, and I, the, the, the truth, when Paul says, I labor and strive to be able to present people complete in Christ, um, if at some point I didn't let go of the responsibility to be the one who makes you grow, I would go nuts because I'm continually discouraged and surprised by sometimes how little people are formed. And I don't know if you're talking about the reveal thing or not, but that kind of thing that came out of the world. Um, um, I, I think anybody who's, yeah, who's really honest about it, Wonder about that. 
I, I have some stuff too about that formation stuff. You know, I mean, I, I'm really into the spiritual formation movement, if you will. We're really dialed into that. I love Dallas Willard stuff. Um, um, but I, I tell you, I, I, I've just found over the years there's some things that I don't care how many candles you're lighting. Um, there, 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 there are people when you get close to their stuff, they don't want you much more near their stuff. And and um, formation formation happens when we, among other things, are willing to look at our crap and call it that. And and one of the things that's huge at Open Door is we talk about grace a lot. I don't mean just talk about it. My whole thing on grace, why grace needs to be central, is because grace. This is very personal to me. Um, if I don't believe there's grace, I'm going to hide. But if there's grace for whatever is going on inside of me, I can say it out loud. I, I really, you know, I really do think one of the reasons I'm so like that, it's not a theology for me. It is a, the reality of God's grace to me is uh, changed my life. That I don't have to pretend and I don't have to hide. And there's nothing I can't look at. Nothing I can't look at. Tell you about. Now, I might not tell you, but that group on Friday knows everything. And um, that's formational. So, and it's not, you know, anyway, I'm going round and round on the phrase here. So. I had a question. If we jump, go back to the expositional preaching, mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to imagine this. Uh, like, how do, you, how do you pick, you know, when you're looking at the scope of the sequence of your preaching, how do you determine what you're going to be doing next or how long you stay in a book? In my, my own background, I've seen exposition, old preaching, but not you know, preaching through an entire book for a year or something. Sure. So I'm trying to fathom like, how does that actually work? How do you determine? Look, it's one and a half years, and then after that, we're going to do first king. Yeah, no, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I've never gone. Well, we're going to do Philippians for a year and a half. I have no idea how long it's going to last. I know there's there's really different models out there, and I have some very good friends who are pastors. I have, a, I have a good friend in town in Minneapolis who who maps out his sermons over for a year. I can't imagine doing that. I envy that. There's part of me that envies that. There's part of me that wonders. I don't know how you do that. When when I get into Philippians, um, okay, okay. Let me let me tell you. I, I'm in a section of Corinthians or Colossians right now. I touched on the verse. I read it. That in him is um, hidden all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge. And I'm trying, and I'm telling you this, and no one will delude you. And and then later on in verse eight, um, uh, he says something to the effect of, "See to it that no one uh, takes you captive uh, by the empty deception of the wisdom of men and the elementary principles of the world." Okay. Um, so what do you preach about that? Well, the, the, being taken captive in Him, I did three weeks on. Um, on, on how in Christ is everything you need to know about life and how to live it and what really is the good life. That little phrase, the good life. I think I tapped into Dallas Willard at all. Oh, yeah. So I did a bunch of Dallas Willard stuff about what is the good life, what are the questions that people ask. Well, I didn't know that was going to last two weeks. Well, now I'm going, okay, if, if everything I need to know about life is in Christ, hidden, the treasure is in him, and now Paul's saying, but be really careful that having been rooted in and built up in Christ, he says in verse 7, see to it that no one deceives you uh, with empty deception. Now, now some would go, okay, so what you need to preach on here is don't listen to Oprah, you have good theology. And what I went was, I, I heard idolatry. Don't let the world, um, if Jesus knows everything there is to know about life and how to live it and what the good life is, what are the, what are the fundamental things about life that could deceive us? And I thought of three, money, sex, and power. And I'm in my fourth week on money and how what the world says about money and where you get life from it, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to do some stuff on sex, and I don't know how long we're going to be in that. And that's how, I mean, it's a good joke in church because um, because we don't know how long. I don't. It's not a year and a half. It's like we, I, I, I get into these texts, like the one I just read to you, that we just gave you in the mind, and, uh, and, and I'm with a team of guys, and... I'll preach the first week, and it'll be kind of exegetical, and it feels like, I wish I could describe this better, but sometimes I feel like I'm walking in a room and I'm going, oh, man, didn't him is trending, sharing the wisdom and knowledge, and I start looking at that, and all of a sudden, but then, and then I, I start seeing all these other things, and we talk about sitting down in it for as long as we want. We're gonna sit down in this, and I don't know how long it's gonna be. 
Um, and then when I'm done, I'm done. And, and you kind of know when you are. And I, I, every once in a while, I have this tension, like I'm milking this now. And you know, I was kind of done last week, and why did I do another week? I got nothing left to talk about on this. And, um, and I hope this is somewhat clear, at least in terms of how it happens, because I don't know how long it's going to be. And um, it just ends up, at the end of the year and a half, I go look back and I go, whoa, look a year and a half, holy cow. So, yeah. This rabbi thing, Again, it started with this one paradigm of Jesus as a rabbi. I was fascinated by that, and then I got into, who's this guy in Michigan? I can't think of his name. Because I found out the source that Bell, Rob Bell found, and I found out his source. And I was fascinated by all the history of the, of the, the humanity of Christ. And so, I, but where, so where did I go with that? I went, we did the sermon on Mount eventually, but actually I went into the Old Testament. And I started talking about the law that Jesus loved. And I, I said things like this. Jesus was not a Christian. And the people freak. <laughs> Tell them that. <laughs> Jesus was not a Christian. He was a Torah observant Jew. What was it about the law that he loved? What did he love about this? Because he was raised on this. And I taught the Ten Commandments. Um, from the perspective of a rabbinic tradition and what it was and, and how it was that then a real easy transition from the Ten Commandments, let's go to the Sermon on the Mount. Because as a rabbi, that would have been, remember the yoke thing? I don't know if you're even familiar with that. Jesus is a rabbi thing, and rabbis would have a yoke, and that was their way of interpreting the Torah. And so when I went to the Sermon on the Mount, it was Jesus. This is his yoke. This is his interpretation of Torah. You've heard I said, don't commit murder. I say, let's talk about your anger. You know? I mean, I just love the picture of Jesus Jesus sitting on the side with these, these young guys going, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Let's talk about, let's talk about your lust. <laughs> these, you guys, you guys any struggles with lust here? Anybody? Anybody? No, no, liars. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, you mentioned briefly about having uh, vision talks. Can you expand on more of how you do that and what causes those to occur? Um, you know, I, what I wish we would do, I was just talking about this the other day. We should have a day every year that we do the vision talk, but it kind of comes up and it averages out about once a year. And what I do is call them lock over talks. And um, I kind of pull up that whole uh, metaphor of. Uh, this is now where you play the game. We play the game out there. And I kind of even, I use it to confront um, how stupid it would be. I, I, it's like, I confront the idea that people come to church and put on their best. You know, it would be like a baseball player coming off the field with a bat and start hitting them on the locker room. Nobody's impressed that you're hitting in here. Get out there. Be, be here and, you know, sit here. And, so I really, we really pray this, like what the purpose of our church is for. Uh, uh, some of you have been playing, and you don't say, if the game was football, you're injured, and you wonder if you're going to get the game again. So now you're in the locker room, and we're here to make sure you heal and patch up. And we'll, we'll talk about our, you know, that dimension of our ministry. And, um, um, but but ultimately, the setting, the setting of the vision, of our vision, and it's kind of, sometimes it's just reminding people that we're all about, your ministry, what we, one of the phrases we use, and I, I'll pull it up in a vision talk, is your ministry is your life. It's not necessarily you're teaching a class here. Your ministry is your life. So how's your marriage? And and um, how how um, how do you treat the people you work with? That's that's your ministry, and that's that's the effect. That's a kingdom effect. That, that and just kind of keeping that fresh in people's minds. It's kind of, and then there's generally some. Maybe there'll be some new, okay, we just, in our, in our we call it next generation, next gen uh, ministry, which is our college, high school, junior high, it's all built on the mentoring model. So, so when I do a vision talk, when that was new, that would be, that would be brought in under, under the umbrella of a lot more time, for instance. Uh, I wanted you to talk about uh, pastoring your family in the midst of pastoral ministry, maybe even how the size of your church has affected that, pastoring your family, um, yeah, the strategies and stuff like that. Talked a little bit about that on uh, Tuesday. Um, and, uh, I mean, pastoring my family, part of it, it's really woven into it. To answer that, I kind of have to tell a story, a little bit of a story. <clears throat> and that is that about... Well, for, for one thing, my, my philosophy, philosophy of rape, I grew, up in a pa I grew up in a pastor's home, so I was pretty sensitive to not put my kids under the pressure of, you have to be better than everybody else, or, 
I, I, I felt like it just, I knew how to do that. Um, just let them be who they are. Um, but 16 years or so ago, I really hit the wall. And um, I shared, so some of you, yes, I won't go into the whole thing again because it would be boring to you, but um, I, one of the, the biggest things that ever happened to me was when we hit the wall, I hit the wall, I was really exhausted with the church. The church had exploded in a good way, and it was growing, 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 growing. And I was just exhausted and angry, and I came to this conclusion that you couldn't be the senior pastor of a mega church and a healthy person, uh, that you had to pick. You know, either I'm the success of a pastor of a successful church, and not a healthy person, or I'm a healthy person, and I got to kiss this goodbye. And that really made me mad. And the anger is what got me into counseling. And after I got into counseling about that, they asked, the guy said, bring in your wife. And we got into some counseling around our marriage, and that changed everything. And I'm not telling you very well how I passed through my kids. I think, you know, you know what I would say? <laughs> uh, be the real deal. The most important thing you can do for your kids is be the real deal yourself. And part of what I mean by that is love your life. When, when I talked about this counseling thing that we went into, one of the things I had to face was how little I love my wife. How much I love me. How much of my ministry was really driven by my need to be successful and noticed and applauded and um, had nothing to do with God. I talked about God every day. Dealing with those kind of issues, you want to, you know, you know I don't, it's almost like I get a little, <laughs> you know, um, have devotions with them. Have devotions with them. If you're an idiot, it won't matter. <laughs> it won't matter. If, if you're a jerk, it won't matter. You have devotions with them. It will probably be worse. Don't have devotions with them. Don't tell them any of your ideas are from God if you're a jerk. Uh, honestly, like, do your work. Um, I don't know how to um, get people to do that, but I know what I mean by that. Do your work. Be, you know. I mean, part of part of being in the ministry for me. My dad was a real guy. Uh, you know, he was authentic, and transparent. He didn't pretend he was something that he wasn't. Some of what I talked about came out of that, I'm sure. And I somehow got that inside of me too. And um, man, if I have, a, I mean, I, <laughs> my wife and I have a very normal marriage. Okay, it means there's tension and stress. But if, if I had if I had a fight with my wife just before I preach, I, I don't know if I could preach. I mean, I, I, I know I've done it, but I, I, I just keep coming. I, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Forget me. Good night. Anyway, <laughs> be a real dude, and you can do it. You know, we can do that. Again, this is weird because it is kind of what I talked about. You, you can't be perfect, but you can be real. You can, you can honestly look at your stuff and be honest about it. And it's incredible. You talk about kids, how forgiving. How do we, I, we talk openly with our kids. We have four kids, and they're all working on But, uh, oh man, I remember Chris, you know that time? Oh God, I'll, tell, I'll tell you, here's a story about you know, fathering your kids. It's more with the mistakes you make. It's like, I did it right. Um, my, my son was reading this a long time. He was reading that John Eldridge book, Wild at Heart, and the Father Wound. And I had given, and he was, this is, he was a high school kid when, he, when this happened. This is several years ago now. And, and he was talking about the book, because I couldn't believe it, because, you know, he didn't read. He's kind of, and, <laughs> and, and I said, are you reading the book? He said, yeah. He says, where are you? He said, the Father Wound. And I said, and it was just so bizarre, because we were heading to sectional couch, and we were watching the Cubs game. And my son was here, I was here, and my wife was here. And I'm talking to him, and I says, did, did, did you remember a wound? He goes, yeah. And I said, wow. And all of a sudden, the you know, temperature in the room changed. And I said, what, what, what do you remember? And he said, well, remember that time we went to that, the Bears game? And I was slow, and I wasn't moving fast enough, and you just yelled at me. And I sat down and wouldn't go. And I don't know how to remember that. And I said, <laughs> I don't remember what I said. Now my son is huge. He went to state as an all as a as a heavyweight wrestler. He's huge, huge kid. He can kill me. <laughs> His chin starts to shake. I said, I said, I don't remember what I said, but I remember that. And he goes, I remember what he said. He started crying. That's what I meant. Uh, create an environment where you can save your son. 
because you're going to screw up. Okay? You're going to do it wrong. You're going to um, shame them and, and hurt them. And, 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 but you, they'll notice if you're the real deal. They just will. They will. Um, that's me. There's been a lot of uh, talk in the last decade or so about men and church and how men hate going to church and that sort of thing. I don't know if you're familiar with some of that. Yeah. Richard Eldridge talks about it as well, yeah. of course, extensively. Do you have, you're, you're in a larger church, do you have specific strategies um, for addressing that problem or does it just come out of the overflow of your ministry or what? Is it, is it not a problem for your church? I mean, what, what would you have to say to that? Um. There have been times when there's, it's been a problem. Um, I'm not going to say it's never been a problem. Um, I understand what people are talking about when they talk about the feminization of the church. I think I think I do. Um, but uh, we, we have a men's ministry. Um, I'm kind of involved in it. But I, it, no, it hasn't. Uh, this, this is going to sound weird. I, don't, I wish I could describe this better. But I think churches kind of have a personality. And I'm... I'm pretty, you can probably tell, I'm pretty kind of blah, and I'm kind of a guy, and I, uh, guys, I, we haven't had a lot of trouble with normal guys being drawn to me. Um, they like it that there's not a lot of BS. I mean, I think it's not like you don't get, it. you don't have to talk about sports all the time. What, what people want is something real and um, just kind of out there and, uh, so no, no, not not any less broad with that draw men. No more than we that draw them. Um, our thing was like we got to be real and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So. Uh, you've talked a little bit about how uh, you've lasted so long at your church. To other churches and all that stuff. How, how uh, have you managed to stay at one church? Did you set intentional boundaries early on? Um, you know, we're not going to leave, or uh, was that an accident? Um, how did that happen? That's a great question, and I, I don't know. <laughs> but I do know. Okay, obviously, you didn't, no, I didn't go in to say 30 years. That's my goal. That was never my goal. Um, in fact, if I had a goal, I was 27 when I went, and I thought, I think I told you this, I don't think I told you this, but I thought, you know, if I was here for 10 years, that's a long time, and I'll be 37 years old. I'll be a young pastor, and blah, blah, blah. So I was thinking like that. I did have, I had a high value. My dad had two churches in his life, okay? So I kind of just looked at that and said, I, there's something about that that is significant and substantial. You, I wouldn't want to get to the place where the people want you to leave, you know, you know hanging on. I'm staying whether you like it or not. <laughs> um, um, I really have, at times, wondered myself, how do you stay for 30 years? Um, there have been times, quite frankly, that I desperately wanted to leave. When I talked about hitting the wall 16 years ago, I, I, uh, uh, God, get me out of here. Just get me out of here. I would have... I wanted to go anywhere. It's, it's odd. There, there have been times. One goofy explanation is that the times when I really wanted to go somewhere and would have, there wasn't any opportunity. Nobody's going, hey, Dave, you know. And other times when there was, uh, you know, somebody calling and saying, would you consider, I just wasn't in a place where I was interested um, for whatever reason. Um, but for instance, just to give you an example of that time when I hit the wall and I desperately wanted to leave, I, I felt like God spoke to me. During that time, and um, and, and the, 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 the word I got was um, I got a picture of our church at the time. I'd been there 12 years, and so so pretty much fresh out of seminary, 27 years old. I got a picture of you know when I first got here, we were like a bunch of we were doing our dream. Everybody had five high this and it's great. This is so fun. And now 12 years in, we had like an adolescent church. That's what it looked like to me. Very immature, you know, the spiritual, the the, the, um, the adultery on the staff, some of the stuff in the in the the product of the ministry didn't look very good to me. And I felt like um, what God said was that you can eat. 
if you were going to leave, there's no sin in you leaving. But this church is an adolescent church, and would you be willing to consider the possibility that some of the behaviors that irritate you about this church, it's just like your own kids or adolescents. When I look at my kids, I look at their behavior. When they were adolescents, they did things that embarrassed me. I go, that's not my kid. <laughs> uh, yes, he is. Yes, he is. And, and some of what's in him is in you, and he got it from you. And I felt like God said to me, in fact, I know God said to me, Dave, would you be willing to wear the mantle of a father in this church? I, I, I told this to our people uh, at one point when I knew I was staying, and um, this is a very, this is weird, I'm getting on this. This matters to me. This is a big life thing for me. Um, I felt like God at that time said, because you're not just at a seminary anymore, and this adolescent church needs a father. And it felt very awkward. Like, who am I? Like, you're my children. Hello, little God. You know, like that again? <laughs> I'm your father. Call me Father Dave. Um, but I knew what that meant your father and, and part of what you do is you don't leave. Your dad, if you're the dad, you don't leave. And I and I, and I, but I and I remember talking about that with the people um, that this is a jacket that um, doesn't fit. Um, and I felt like God said you will go into it. Will you put it on? And I said yes. And I am I'm uh, I have that. Um, I, I, you know, we talked about John Elkins. The guy I really like is Richard Rohr. Um, if you want to do the men's spiritual journey, dial into this Richard Rohr guy, R O H R, he's a Catholic, Franciscan priest. Um, and he talks about um, king energy and warrior energy and um, father energy. And I know in our church right now, it's a weird transition because I love to preach. And, and in the early days, it was like it was built on the preaching. And I think. What the young guys in our church right now need from me most is not my preaching. It's me. And I have father energy. And it's, it's cold. It feels real comfortable now. In fact, I'm coming into grandfather energy. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is, yeah. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we'll play the park and then go home. <laughs> I don't think, does that make any sense? Because they're, they're, you stay 30 years by a lot of times um, it, it starts with valuing the long term pressing through some hard things um, but to be quite frank I'm not always sure if it's a noble thing that I stay or it's on chicken I you guess uh, so it makes sense that you made an intentional decision after that one point but how about those first 12 like, it seems like you're just saying it was God's sovereignty that I made it to that point some of it was. I, the first five years, I can tell you, that, the first five years at Open Door were in battle. Um, in fact, I joke about the reason I don't go to another church is because I would never want to go through that again, and I assume you would. Because it was, it was a small church, about 160 people, uh, when I got there, and it was run uh, by, and I think I have a theory on churches that size that have been there. Not that there's anything wrong with that at all, but, but this church was stuck, and it was run by a family. And there was a there was a core of people who had all the power, and um, and they pretty much at, they they loved me when I first came, but when they found out that I wasn't going to do everything they wanted and didn't think like them, they hated my guts and tried for five years everything they could do to get rid of me. In fact, there was a there was one thing in particular I remember they 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 got a bunch of people. It's a long story, so I won't tell the whole thing. But they got a whole bunch of people to quit giving, and they all gave the missions because we had made a decision that they didn't like and just to find out that people were intentionally doing things that would would get you fired and that was horrifying to me um, and some of that quite frankly was just uh, I'm not leaving. you may kick me out they may fire me but I ain't and it took six years it was about five the sixth year of my ministry at open door was it was after the fifth year was the first time I had elders who were on the same page with me, who had, it, it doesn't mean they agreed with me, but they had the same heart that I did. The first five years, I described the elders of our church, they would steer like this, and it was my job to get ministry around them. It never came from them. They were all, no, you can't do that. Okay. <laughs> you know, they would love to make decisions about ministry, they just didn't want to do it. I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, and so those first three years, actually, they, they were about 
if I didn't have my dad, my dad was alive at the time, but I, I wonder if I could have survived those first ten, five years without my dad um, saying, yeah, this is church day. Yeah, yeah this is what church is like day. Um, yeah, you haven't bled yet, babe. Um, <laughs> he, he, that's okay. he was 12. You have not suffered to the point of blood. So hang in. Keep preaching the word. Keep preaching the word. Keep preaching the word. I, I honestly, in the early days, it felt like I would preach. I would preach in such a way that it would, I don't know how to describe this, it would actually push things back. I could breathe again until Tuesday. <laughs> Seriously. And, um, and then, you know, things exploded and we were having a ball and I never knew ministry could be so much fun when we, we, we all had the same vision and desire. And, you know, it was, anyway, it was we've got time for two more questions. Um, just in regards to what you just talked about, uh, the uh, level of criticism that people deal with in ministry positions, I feel like uh, as we grow in our own walk, our insecurities are going to become you know, balloon blips and when we get criticism. How do you handle the criticism and your own insecurities that come out of that and how they interact? Um, I hate the when, when you said it, you know, the criticism, uh, just, I could feel something like stir in my gut when you said it. Um, I, I, I wish I could say after 30 years, well, I'm going to employ it. It doesn't bother me. Yes, it does. And I, I wish I could tell you how to make it. There, maybe there are certain temperaments that don't. Um, one, thing, one thing I do with criticism, on emails or whatever, how whatever form it comes in. I have I have a group of people I talk about everything. So I don't I don't ever carry anything by myself. I, and I had that, that accidentally that's some good advice. It's just I think that is some good advice. I don't carry anything by myself. Um, and, and quite frankly some criticism is they're right. You know they're, they're right you are a teacher or whatever or you did that wrong there. And so even even having people who can carry with it carry it with you and say, hey, you know, this time, the right ones. Um, but I, I have to tell you, it, it, it really, um, it is appalling, to tell you the truth, the kind of criticism that, that you can get in a church. I just think it's really, um, uh, doesn't speak well, actually, for the church. And I, and I, would, I would want to, um, some of the younger guys that I'm with right now, I want to, part of what, what I want to be with them in is be with them in learning how to absorb some of that stuff. Because some of them, I mean, I, I, I'm around some really, really gifted people. Kid, you know, not kid, but they're, they're younger, they're early 30s, late 20s. And, um, but it's like, I, there, there's nothing that takes the wind out of their sails. Like, people who didn't, who they, they didn't say it right. They said it the wrong way or something. It's not usually the criticism that get, it, it can get so angry, and it's usually not over something substantial. It's something they didn't like the song you sang, or what, <laughs> or it's too loud, or, or you mentioned Rob Bell's voice. Like somebody leave our church because I mentioned that I read Rob Bell's voice. Bye. Uh, uh, you know, I don't agree with everything Rob Bell says. I don't agree with everything I say. <laughs> no, right now, people. Um, I, I, had a, I had an email two weeks ago. I was on vacation. I came back and I had three or four emails. And one was accusing me of having lust for a woman in our church. It was anonymous. Um, it's just bizarre. The, things. the people from a distance go, oh, I know. You do not. <laughs> I, I, anyway, um, some of it you have to do. I always show it to the elders. That's another a, a group that I really trust. And I do trust my elders now. Sometimes I, I know there are guys. There are guys, and women and men and women in ministry, the people they would least trust in their church would be young. And that would have been true of me in the early days. Right now, they may be the group I trust the most. Uh, I would trust them with anything. Um, uh, but I would, I, 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 just think, I, I should shut up now because I think, don't carry that, don't carry that by yourself. Um, and, I, and I wish it was different. 
I, I wish it wasn't that way. I'm, I'm always amazed, and, and we, we can laugh about it. It's part of it. sharing with people, like we'll kind of process some stuff at staff meetings on Wednesday. But I'm, I'm amazed, and, and maybe it's part of a big church, I'm amazed at people who will come up to me after a service, and they've never been there before. And they'll have some critique on my message, and, I, and I'll look at them and I'll go, honestly, I'll, I'll be polite and stuff, but I'm looking at them going, I'm trying to figure out what kind of person comes to a church they've never been, and they feel compelled to go up and correct the guy. You're an idiot. You're a whack job. I don't get it. Go away. Why do you think I care what you think? I don't. I don't. I really don't. But it drives me nuts. So, but that's not very Christ like I know. <laughs> but it's not my job to stand before you first. It's hard, man. I, I mean, honestly, that's something. Uh, yeah. One more question. Okay. It sounds like that transition from having a group of elders that you didn't trust to a group of elders that you do was a pretty big one in your church. What dynamic came about to where that, that transition happened? Or what would you recommend to us as future pastors about how we can go about cultivating that sort of group of elders? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Well, what I did, I don't necessarily recommend. But one, one, one is there. I was pay attention. Not to what I'm about to say, but but, <laughs> but, but in in your church, and, and like pay attention. Who who um, is drawn to to your spirit, to the vision you have? Who in your church? Who are the men and the women who, when you talk, they go? There's a, this was a pivotal moment for me. I was five years into um, the ministry that opened the door. I was exhausted. The church was beginning to grow. Now, it wasn't explosive growth, but it was growing. And I remember being on the couch in my um, Brooklyn Park home, which means nothing to do with that. I remember where I was. And I thought, I'm going to die young. I, I really thought I was going to die young because I'm just a mess. And I don't remember how I came to this, but I think it's in numbers where God goes to Moses. For Moses, Moses says to God, God, if you're going to be, if you're going to make me responsible to feed all these people, please kill me now. And that's what exactly how I feel. And God's response to Moses when he said that was, and this is obviously my paraphrase, quit whining. And what I want you to do, Moses, is go find the elders who are the elders. And it's the weirdest thing. I don't, I don't know. I knew who they were. And when I read that verse, and I was in this place where I thought, I'm just going to die. He, and, then, and then God said to Moses, go find the elders in Israel, who are the elders, and I, I, I know who they are. And they're not all that important. Now, how do you fix that? You start saying stuff like that out loud. I remember there was a guy named Wes. Okay. When I first went to the church, it was real clear who the good guys were and who the bad guys are. I even had good Pharisees. I had the Pharisees. Um, he's an Ishmael. Galatians, you know, Paul talks about the Ishmaels and cast up the bottom of and son. These people are they, they call Abraham their father and God their father, but they're they're not born of the spirit and they're Ishmael. So say I, I knew that really. But then all of a sudden this other phase came that was much more confusing because some of the people I thought were bad guys, they were bad guys. They were Isaacs, they loved God, but they weren't on board with where we're going. Les was a godly man who loved God. Okay, but he was an elder. But he was resisting everything we were doing. And what was one, among the things that was happening in the church, a lot of disenfranchised people were coming. There was a real message on brokenness and grace and um, bring your junk. We were having effective stuff with alcoholics and um, um, this kind of messy stuff. Messy people were coming. I mean, I, I tell a story about it. I knew my dream. I had a dream of, of people coming to our church who looked a lot more like the people Jesus ministered to. Um, and... Um, that was what was happening. And I said to Les one day, I said, Les, if you came to our church next week, he's an older guy, and, and you came for the very first time to, to open door next week, it was the first time, would you come back? Because the church had really changed since I came. It was about six years in, and now it was messy. And I mean, I, I, I was going to tell you this dream I had was this guy after church. I remember this guy coming forward for prayer. 
great big guy, dirty t-shirt, long stringy greasy hair with a thing on his t-shirt that was something about desiring to stamp out virginity in his lifetime. That was what was on his t-shirt and he was in my church coming forward for prayer with tears streaming down his cheeks. And to me, that was a dream come true. Because this guy five years earlier would have not been allowed in the door by the usher. You can't come in. Well, he was in and he was broken and he was coming for prayer. And that's the kind of stuff that, so I say to Les about stuff like that, would you come next week if you came for the first time, would you come back? And he said, no. And I said, you're not known. And I didn't fire him. I didn't, I didn't have the authority to fire him, but I said, Les, you're not an elder here. You can't, you can't lead, because uh, this is where we're going. And you, if you don't like this, you can't lead it. I love you. And that was hard. Uh, and eventually, we came back around and loved each other very much, but he loved the Lord. And so did other people like that. But there are times you have to say it. And, and I did. But see, that, 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 there's another thing. You've got to be willing to lose your job. I have this whole phrase. I say this to pastors all the time. If you do what God tells you to do, and say what God tells you to say, you will never lose your ministry. But you might lose your job. Do you know the difference? Do you know the difference? Because there is a difference. I know a lot of guys who kept their job. They got no edge. They have no edge. There's nothing prophetic. There's nothing transformational. It just, they just, everybody likes them. It's pathetic. Ah, it's on like a mean guy now. Yeah. It's a good enough to end on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks again, and thanks to Pat Henry Center for sponsoring this. Yeah, really, 